Hi everyone, welcome to lecture number six, which is on pastoral. So for this lecture, we're still going to be staying with the Greeks. Um, we've moved forward a good bit though, and it's worth noting. So Hesiod is one of the earliest Greek writers back then, way back with, with Homer. Then we move to, to Plato and Socrates. Um, but now we're moving ahead yet again to uh, almost a couple hundred years, well, not quite past Plato, but toward the end of, uh, and certainly past the height of the Greek empire and sort of toward the end of it with Theocritus. But anyhow, the material that we're going to talk about today is pastoral. You may have heard this word. You may be familiar with it as a type of art or type of literature. And it's also used colloquially, right? When you see like a beautiful scene, you'd say it's a pastoral scene. The fact is pastoral has been with us since before Theocritus and certainly a lot after. And in fact, the next lecture, we're going to be looking at Virgil. And Virgil is a Roman poet, so he's coming even after Theocritus, who really takes the, um, the idea of pastoral and runs with it. And without going into detail, because we're going to do that in the lecture, but what pastoral is about more than anything else is how human beings in the West imagined uh, sort of a perfect relationship to the planet. This is an important point, right? Because that's kind of what we should be trying to do. We do that in a very contemporary way with the idea of sustainability. That's sort of, you know, an ideal endpoint if we can do that and have a sustainable relationship to the planet. Yeah, pastoral is not like that, but pastoral is, is the same basic idea. But it looks back either um, to a long, an earlier period in, in the same way that we saw in the Judeo-Christian tradition, the idea of looking back to Eden or with Hesiod, again Greek, uh, looking back to the Golden Age, to a time when things were much better. Our relationship with the planet was really great. Pastoral, and we'll go into this in detail, imagines that, but imagines it can also be kind of coexisting with us on the very fringes of civilization, far out in a rural environment. But the idea is still the same, that there is this sort of lost relationship that we had with the, the, the planet. And, you know, in Judeo-Christian tradition, that happens because of original sin, something kind of similar to it with Pandora in, in Hesiod. Um, but still, the idea is that we had this relationship once and we lost it. It's, it's an incredibly interesting idea because, you know, I've, I've argued that we should think of it the other way around, that we've really never had that kind of relationship with the planet, but we should have it, and we should imagine it as, as an end game in the future. But that's not the Western tradition. So let me jump right in, and we'll look at how all this plays out, and I'll be giving you some different examples along the way. Let me get us queued up here. Here we are, and here's our Prezi, and we're here at number six. So let's jump right in, uh, get down here and get us in. Okay, lecture six. Notice we're still doing eco-criticism. So this isn't really theology what we're doing today. This is not um, a theological belief pastoral, but rather a type of art. And we'll talk about that in, in some detail. So let's just jump right in. So pastoral. So an important point is pastoral is not a literary genre. So what I mean by a genre is something like a play is a genre, a novel is another form, you know, a poem is yet another form. It's not like that, but it's a mode of writing, a way of writing that can be in any genre altogether. Hence, there are pastoral plays. In fact, we're going to be reading one of them, which is Shakespeare's As You Like It. There are pastoral elegies, um, sort of a funeral uh, thing you, you, you say at a funeral or to commemorate someone's death. Uh, Milton's Lycidas may be the most famous of all there. Um, and Walden, um, sort of the second to the last text that we're going to be looking at, is in some sense a pastoral work too. It's, it's a question exactly what that work is. I'm not going to call it a novel. Um, but 
it it is in the pastoral tradition. So it's just something to be very clear of that uh, clear about. It doesn't really matter what type of written work that you're looking at. I, I guarantee you, you will find pastoral examples. Um, even even songs. There can be pastoral songs. There is pastoral music. I'll give you an example of some in, in a I'll give you an example of one in a minute. So it can be. Um, anything at all. So just to realize, and, and that actually um, hints at how pervasive pastoral is because, you know, if it were just about elegies, for example, just, you know, written in a time when someone passes away, well, you know, how, how, how prevalent could pastoral be in the Western tradition there? It just wouldn't be that common. But here, anything written can be pastoral. Um, and it even extends beyond writing as well. So you, you get an idea and immediately how pervasive this can be. Um, there are, in fact, pastoral paintings. There are, there's pastoral, mu pastoral music. There's pastoral, um, you know, films. Uh, and I'm not talking about documentaries. I'm just films in sort of a pastoral tradition. So it, 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 you begin to get the idea here that if something can, can spread across all these different genres of writing, as well as other forms of, of artistic expression like film and music, it can be very common, and it, and it is very common. So I'm not going to play this for you because this is going up on YouTube. What this would be, if I hit that button, you may know this from your own childhood. This is Disney's Fantasia, uh, which is why I'm I'm not going to play it because if it goes up on YouTube, I don't want Disney to um, suddenly, you know, uh, cause this uh, video to get uh, shut down. Um, but actually, if you're familiar with that scene, um, you may know that the the music there is actually a very famous piece. It's Beethoven Number no. Six, Symphony Number no. Six, which is Pastoral, and this is a symphony that was designed uh, from the title. You get the idea to be a pastoral work to try to musically show what what a pastoral you know uh, the idea of pastoral, and of course Disney then takes the idea using that as the soundtrack, and you know has these these fawns and all playing and the idea is they're trying to visually represent what a pastoral scene would be so it is a good scene um, it should play if you if you go into the prezi if you if you want to actually see it or just hit you know um, disney fantasia pastoral and and you'll you'll get it um, it's it's just it's a good example of how common it is even today so you might think well this is you know died off maybe 200 years ago around Beethoven's time or something. But no, this is not the case. It has continued today. So let me jump right through there before it tries to autoplay on me. This is a painting, and we're going to talk about this painting again uh, during this lecture, but I wanted to give it to you as an example of what pastoral is. And I haven't really talked quite about that. Um, notice that in this scene, it's a beautiful setting. Um, there is a person over here, but a very small presence in the work. Pastoral then, and what makes it so interesting from our point of view, from an environmental or eco-critical point of view, it's thoroughly foregrounding the environment. It's about the environment. Pictorially, this is a good example of it. This is a, what's imagined, and this is Painted, I think, 1861 in the U.S. This is imagined as a perfect, serene, pastoral scene. What do I mean by that? It's a beautiful, inviting scene. There are actually cows here, which is sort of a uh, uh, an acknowledgement that in the United States um, this time there weren't that many sheep by comparison, so they sort of got imported into the scene. But traditionally, this would be a shepherd with sheep. It's interesting because pastoral keeps getting reinvented again and again and again, and the sheep can fade away, or here they kind of get transformed into, into cows. But the scene is the same basic idea. It's a beautiful, inviting place. It's not scary. It's not like a high mountain or anything like that. This is not Yosemite. This is not the Grand Canyon. And I'll talk about that distinction as we get further along, like into the 18th century, where this notion of the sublime comes along. But in this period, and for most of human history, the perfect relationship to the planet is going to be imagined this way, an inviting place where you could just sit and enjoy. And in fact, there's not really a lot of work involved here, and I'll get to that in a moment. 
That's the pastoral thing. This is, visually, this is what pastoral is. And by the way, it is always verdant and green. And what I mean by that, pastoral doesn't usually take place in the winter. We're going to actually see an example of it in As You Like It in Shakespeare, but that's Shakespeare being Shakespeare and doing something different with what he has to work with. But for the most part, it's imagined as a perfect springtime setting. Just think of it as like the perfect day where you'd want to go outside in the perfect place, like a perfect park-like setting. This may look like a park, and that's kind of the idea. In fact, right around this time, people um, were, were actually transforming this into, into reality, like Central Park is actually designed um, as, as meant to be like a perfect representation of um, this. But in, in that case, though, it's not, uh, you're not working with clay, you're not working with paint, you're not working with words, but the actual, it's, it was actually formed out of, out of real trees and everything to look perfect. So that's what pastoral looks like. So here's a wonderful pastoral poem. And, and I give this to you in part because it indicates that pastoral in an informal way existed before Theocritus. So this is like 400 years before Theocritus, and yet pastoral is alive and well. So let me just read to you here. Come to me here from Crete, to this holy temple where your lovely apple grove stands and your altar that flickers with incense, and below the apple branches cold, clear water sounds, everything shadowed by roses and sleep that falls from bright shaking leaves, and a pasture for horse blossoms um, with flowers of spring and breezes are flowing like honey. Come to me here. So this is Sappho, and an, an absolutely beautiful poem. But again, if you think of the, the painting that we just saw, this is trying to create that kind of scene in words, right? It's in beautiful apple groves. So right off the bat, this is not wilderness. This is not Yosemite. This is, in terms of... Um, uh, what we saw with Gilgamesh, this is kind of like a built environment. In other words, this could be a description of what was inside the walls of Iraq, where this is where people had, in some sense, modified the environment. And, and that's a crucial part of, of pastoral, I think. In other words, it's not pristine, untouched places by human beings, but rather places that human beings have sort of perfected as being natural and uh, and sort of unbothered by by bad things. Um, so, and everything here, the smell, the taste, everything is meant to be like a wonderful place. And, you know, you, you, you want to come there, um, to, to that place. So it's a good point because pastoral, it's, you know, in a formal sense, becomes inaugurated with Theocritus and sort of brought to a height with Virgil a few centuries later. But it has always existed. And, and any kind of um, nature writing about a perfect, beautiful, inviting nature, which this is, is informally pastoral. And we, we use the word very sort of informally today. So, you know, you had read a poem, you know, written very recently same kind of topic, same way of going about it, you'd call that a pastoral poem, even though it might not be technically the same way that it will be with Theocritus and Virgil. So, moving on. Art and literature. Yeah. The thing about it, and if you go through most of Western history uh, and you look at pastoral art, uh, whether it's visual art or a description, you know, written like we just saw with Sappho, you're often going to literally find pastures with um, shepherds and sheep in them. Um, so that's that's almost a dead giveaway. And again, it's not always going to be there. So that painting, which I keep, uh, which we looked at, I keep talking about, which we'll look at again, um, that had cows rather than sheep. But basically, you know, more than one person has said, you know, um, no sheep, no pastoral, and then the sort of you know a, a, a signature, you know, inclusion. But it doesn't always have to be. But here's the tricky part, which I talk about in this slide here: that pastoral literature may not principally be about out shepherds and sheep and, and and even the environment at all and that's a tricky thing about pastoral so I just want to like explain this I'll go to it in detail but I'll explain what's going on here we're talking about pastoral because it is the predominant way that people in the Western tradition imagine their relationship to the planet up until a couple hundred years ago so it's very important the problem is and what makes it sort of messy for us is that pastoral 
isn't always about the environment. I wish it was. It would be so much easier for this course if it were simple. But I, I need to explain to you that it can can operate differently. And that's what makes it complicated. I'm sorry it is, it is messy for us, but it's, it's still we have to do pastoral, which is so important. But we need to acknowledge this fact that it's not always about the environment. So what is it about? Let me explain. Um, first off, Pastoral has been undergoing, you know, many changes uh, over the years. So while it literally is about the environment, um, even as early as Virgil, and we're going to get to Virgil during the next lecture, number seven, um, it shifts away from being about the environment exclusively and starts talking about politics and culture more broadly. So it's a, it's a form, and it's not surprising, right, because it is so old that it would go under, you know, transformations again and again. And with Virgil, it becomes this veiled way of talking about something, and I'll explain what that means in a moment. And that that is, an, is a major shift in it, and that becomes very influential. In fact, people have argued that after Virgil, and Virgil's writing about 2,000 years ago, a little, a little older, that his way of talking where allegory is involved as well is, is sort of like all pastoral after it will, will be sort of a footnote to Virgil. And that's true, and we're going to have to look at Virgil carefully for that reason. But the main thing to know here is that pastoral doesn't literally have to be about the environment. Instead of being literal, it can also be allegorical. So let me explain what that is, because that's the twist here, the move toward allegory. Um, allegory, as allegory, pastoral provides a pretty safe way of talking about political, ecclesiastical, meaning religious or other sensitive issues. So if you're, if you're writing pastoral, so, okay, so you live in a government that does not allow for free speech. You want to critique the government, let's say, for an example. How do you do that? You can't come right out and write something like that. Um, that would that could get you killed or your hand cut off and all. And I'm not only talking about ancient times, but even you know Shakespeare's time and all. That, those sort of things happen. You you don't you don't mess with the monarch. <laughs> That's basically the idea. Or or anyone in, in you know the greater power position than you are. But if you want to critique it. And if you're an artist, a writer, you may want to do just that. What do you do? Well, and, and Virgil is really the one who, who, who you know, runs with this ball. Um, you instead write a pastoral story. What's it about? It's about, you know, shepherds experiencing hard times, being unhappy with the status quo. Um, you can be very specific if you're very careful about doing it in a veiled way. You can say that these shepherds are unhappy because they have a lot of taxes and they're unhappy about the taxes. That could be a way of you saying, for example, and we'll see people, um, that, you know, you're unhappy about Queen, Queen Elizabeth and the kind of, you know, government she's running. Um, you can be pretty specific, but you have to really walk kind of a, a knife's edge here because on the one hand, you want to be specific and, and talk about things so that people understand it's a critique. On the other hand, you want to be far enough away from it that you can say at any point if someone calls you on it, well, no, I'm, I'm writing about shepherds. I'm not talking about politics or Queen Elizabeth or anything like that. I'm just talking about shepherds. And this becomes surprisingly effective, but you have to be very good at it, right? If you, if you're, if it's not thinly veiled, if it's too obvious, then, you know, you might get your hand cut off. Um, on the other hand, if you're if you're not you know pointed enough in doing it, it doesn't it isn't going to function that way. So when people read it, they're not going to immediately think, oh yeah, this is this is our present plight, you know, taxation or whatever. Um, so it becomes a great form for careful writers who can who can you know be on that knife's edge, and also politically active ones. This is kind of a form of activism, not environmental activism, but sort of political activism, or ecclesiastical can be critiquing of religion or, or any number of things, really. Um, so I'm talking about Queen Elizabeth. An example would be um, Edmund Spencer. He writes a, a work called The Shepherd's Calendar in um, 18... Um, 79. And in that period, in, in, in that work, it's, it's set up to be literally like a farmer's almanac, like a calendar. It goes through 12 months of like a shepherd's life and all. It's actually based on an older French work, which is like a calendar of shepherds that was just that, a very literal sort of environmental thing dealing with 
you know, the the way that a farmer, or in this case a shepherd, will, will do different things as months progress. Um, but actually what it is, is a pretty scorching indictment of Queen Elizabeth and the Church of England, who, which of course Elizabeth is the, the head of here. Um, and, you know, this is not, it would not be a good time to be critical of Elizabeth. People uh, suffered some pretty bad, uh, some pretty bad things happened to people who were critical of Elizabeth. But but Spencer, and he's relatively young in his career here, um, knew that pastoral could be used for this and writes this work that's ostensibly like a farmer's almanac, but in fact is, is, is a biting critique of Elizabeth and the church itself, and in in some cases, people in particular in the church. Um, so he actually. Um takes names, like the name Grindel uh, is the person's name in it and uh, in one of the um, the months, and he changes it to all grind. So it's the same letters and all, and you, if you thought about it and you looked carefully, you'd realize that this guy, Grindel, is being um, critiqued here, but it's all done in a very clever sort of way. But you see, like how, I don't know how to put it, how, how risky Spencer's being there by actually taking a name and playing with the letters and, and saying the name out loud there in the work. So it can be very specific that way. Um, and yet Spencer did not, you know, get censored by Elizabeth. In fact, Elizabeth likes him, but of course Spencer will, will write a great work called The Fairy Queen um, almost a decade and a half later. And in The Fairy Queen, he celebrates Queen Elizabeth. Elizabeth is the Fairy Queen. So it's on the one hand ostensibly this wonderful celebration of her and that work is also a very um, uh, poignant and definite critique of her. So that's how pastoral works in that sense. Um, so the big thing to know is it's a way of writing, subversive writing, dangerous political writing, but doing so in a very masked way. Again, this doesn't actually <clears throat> apply to us, right? I wish it didn't have this second meaning in a sense. Actually not. It's, it's, it actually makes for much more uh, rich um, experiences with works. But in this case, we just have to clarify that this is not about the environment here. This is about, you know, masking other types of writing. Um, here's the twist. In addition to having that allegorical way, it can be a literal form of nature writing. Uh, Virgil's first eclogue, which we're going to see, um, actually combines those and, and works the two together to great effect, both the literal and the allegorical. So, and, and Spencer does that too in the Shepherd's Calendar, um, I've argued, in that um, you can see all this allegory going on, critique of England, critique of Church of England, critique of uh, Elizabeth's reign and all that, but also there's some very real environmental things being brought up there. In that case, deforestation again, which is sweeping through England at that particular time. So it's actually there is a major issue. So it makes these works tricky because on the one hand, they can be critical of you know, political things and allegorical. On the other hand, they can be talking about real environmental problems. So you imagine two shepherds talking about a problem. Sure, it could be taxation that's veiled as, you know, that's being talked about in a veiled way there. Or it could be that there's deforestation going on and this person is being critical of that, which in fact Spencer was doing. So it's complicated and it can be a little confusing and just don't think it's one or the other because in people like Virgil, it, it can be both. It can, and we'll see this with Virgil, how he, he does that in a, in, a, in a very clever way. So, yeah, it's wise not to make any assumptions here because it can be about the environment and not be about the environment and both be about the environment and something other than the environment at the same time. Um, you might think you get a work like the Shepherd's Calendar, or this is going to be all about the environment. It starts talking about things that, you know, seemingly have to do with the landscape and all, but it may not be. So the rule of thumb here really, or the sage advice I have to give you, is that when you encounter pastoral, don't always assume that it's a form of nature writing. It can be, and, and in a very important way. But it can also be allegory too. But sometimes it can be both. And um, I won't give it away with Virgil because we'll get to him during the next lecture. But with the Shepherd's Calendar, for example, um, Spencer is critiquing and being very critical of the people doing deforestation. 
But these are people that, as it turns out, are connected with the Church of England. So he can't come out and attack them directly, but he does in a veiled way. But what he's attacking them for is an environmental problem. So that's interesting. So from our point of view, we, we were, we're not going to do it, but we'd want to take him up. Um, we're not doing the Shepherd's County. We're just too much to do this term. But we would want to take him up and look at that because of, you know, deforestation is an important issue in the 16th century in England. Um, but to do that, we also have to realize that he's doing more than just drawing our attention to it. He's critiquing the dynamics by way by way deforestation is happening. He's critiquing the people who are doing the deforestation and being very critical of them, but he has to do it in a very careful way. So you, you get the idea, it can, it, it can be these things mixed together and often has you know, environmental implications, but you have to look carefully at the text. And we're going to do that with a few texts. So we're going to see it here. Most recently, we're going to hit Virgil next week, um, next lecture. And we're also going to... Um, to do with plays, uh, people like Shakespeare and all as well. So, art and literature. Pastoral as nostalgic and contemporary. This is an important point. So, what do we mean by that? So, you know, like Eden from the Genesis account, Genesis account as well as the Golden Age um, from Heshid, and we'll see that again with Ovid, Pastoral text often posited a locus aminus where human beings live at peace with the planet. We've seen this before, right? This is a characteristic of Eden. It's a characteristic of the golden age that you're imagining this perfect place um, lost to time. Um, pastoral adds to that too because it believes the same thing. There was once a time where people had an environmentally perfect relationship with the planet. Um, it is seen as as being pastoral, literally, with you know shepherds and sheep, but. To the ancient Greeks, um, the Greek islands, when they, you know, they understand, right, they don't have a good understanding of history in Theocritus's time, and they certainly didn't in Hesiod or, or Plato's time. So they don't really know the historical record. They haven't done archaeology. They don't know what life was like a couple thousand years before. But to their way of thinking, the earliest human beings that they know in Greece um, had this relationship with the planet. So, if you're if you'd ask them what was life like, you know, long, you know, for your great 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 grandparents, um, they would have imagined it being pastoral. That's imagined as being the early human condition. Now, that's very different than what we imagine, right? So if, if you believe in evolution, we look back at early humans, whether it's, you know, Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, and keep going back. That's what we imagine is the original human condition. That is not the way it's imagined in this thinking. And in this thinking, human beings had a perfect relationship with the planet. It's come, that's what's coming out of this part of the world. It doesn't matter whether you're getting that from, you know, the Hebrew Testament of the Bible, from Heshut, or now with Theocritus. It's all the same. Everyone believed that was the historical precedent. That was the condition of humanity for the original human beings. And you might believe that for religious uh, reasons, but then now with pastoral literature, you have reason to believe it again um, because it's going to be repeated again and again and again in this particular kind of art form. Um, here's a twist the pastoral brings. So with Eden, it's imagined as being in the distant past. Not all that distant. So if people would have done the math here the way people of contemporary have done, about this time, Eden would have existed 4,000 years before. Um, but that's certainly with Hesiod too. It's imagined pretty far back. I mean, not millions of years. They don't really have that sort of time scale, but pretty far back. Um, you know, but it can also, and this is a difference with Theocritus. This is different with past, this is how pastoral is different from the Genesis account as well as the Golden Age account. It doesn't have to be just distant in time. It can be a distant place, a contemporary place. So if you live in the city, you might imagine that this perfect relationship with the planet still exists, but it's over somewhere out in the country, maybe a few hundred miles away, maybe on some more remote of the Greek islands and all, but it's still imagined as being um, um, existing. So you have here an inversion of the country city dyad that we saw with the myth of Gilgamesh. Remember there, what was outside of 
the walls of the city is is bad, right? That's scary. That's where animals live. That's where, you know, um, Enkidu is at first. That's dangerous. But here, what's outside of the city, if you go far enough away, as is imagined, is not being scary and uninviting, but in fact inviting and pretty perfect. So that view will now continue throughout the West. It continues today. You might imagine, and, and people certainly did this a lot in the 20th century, it's harder to do in the 21st because there aren't that many people on the planet that haven't had first contact with modern civilization. They do exist, um, and if you if you look into it, it's kind of a fascinating thing, encounters that have happened. But um, people will imagine, for example, when they encounter um, well, so the New World is discovered and people are encountered, you know, Native Americans and all, they're often imagined as living pretty perfectly in uh, relationship to the planet. It's complicated the way those representations work, and it has to sort of turn bad when the colonial project heats up. But it's even today, you know, people imagine uh, people who, like, live in the Amazon basin and haven't had first contact with uh, modern culture as living a pretty perfect existence. Where does that come from? It, it doesn't come from the historical record because it's not like, you know, we could look back and say these folks are living like, you know, uh, human beings did 20,000 years ago because we know they didn't have it very good then. Um, but that is still alive and well today, that if you go far enough away from civilization and you find people living on the outskirts, those people are often living pretty perfectly, uh, pretty happy lives, pretty healthy lives, and at peace with the planet. That, again, is different than the historical record. We know that, for example, up until two or three hundred years ago, the average lifespan of a human being was 20, it was 30 years. And there were a whole series of, you know, health issues you had and people, you know, didn't eat very often and all, and all sorts of problems. But in this tradition, those don't exist. This tradition imagines it as being perfect. So you go back to Adam and Eve or you go hundreds of miles to the outskirts of civilization, you'll find the perfect life that people are living. That's the story. That's the story that gets repeated again and again and again. Pastoral being a big uh, part of that repeating. Yeah. So... Pastoral, then, especially as, as, as a literal form of nature writing. So let's set aside the allegory for a moment. So if you're just talking about a wonderful scene where everything is great, it's often very nostalgic. It's looking back to a simpler time. Even though it might be a place that exists today, it's seen nostalgically as a simpler time. So yes, here in the city, we live very modern lives and all, but, you know, hundreds of years ago, we had simpler lives. Most Americans, you know, um, prior to the 20th century, so 120 years ago or so, most were living on farms. Most were living a farm life and all, and it's very simple. People look back to that and think, well, that's what America was really about. That was things were great and wonderful and all. Um, they weren't great. They weren't wonderful, but people like to imagine them that way. But that's nostalgic. And even if we imagine that there are people living like that today, there's an element of nostalgia to it. Not because they're existing in a different point in time than we are. You know, it's still 20 whatever for us and for them. But the idea is they're living like we lived in a previous period. So we want to imagine what life was like a few hundred years ago. Um, and we want to imagine what it's like for them. This can often, by the way, it doesn't have to go back that far. So it's been argued. And in fact, Shakespeare um, is an example of it, that the nostalgia that we're looking back to isn't necessarily thousands or even hundreds of years, but is often the childhood of the person writing it. So people start writing this stuff when they're, you know, in their 50s and all. And they remember their childhood growing up on a farm. And they also, they often write it about it very nostalgically is this sort of perfect time and they want to make America the way it was back then. They actually believe they can. Um, not everyone does. Um, I did grow up on a farm and I can tell you, um, yeah, it had some wonderful pastoral moments, but there was a lot of backbreaking hard work and unpleasantness involved in it all too. Um, that would be cut out. I wouldn't be a very good pastoral writer if I started writing about what life was actually like on a farm. Instead, you have to write about it as, as being, being pretty perfect. And that's the... Uh, that's the sort of cornerstone of pastoral literature and art more generally. Yep. Um, so here's an interesting twist to it. 
Um, because it's writing about a contemporary countryside, pastoral will often um, become a very popular form when there's a lot of turbulence going on. So, for example, during the so-called Industrial Revolution, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, you know, what's, what's the characteristic, uh, um, what's characteristic of, of British culture at the time? Well, British people were leading the Industrial Revolution, you know, in places like Manchester, which were growing incredibly quickly. They were, you know, introducing all sorts of machinery to work, textiles principally, and then a whole range of other things. Factory life then is sort of the cornerstone of what really the first half of the 20th, 19th century would be in England, at least economically. You have a whole range of pastoral writing appearing then, people from like Wordsworth and all who are writing about the beautiful countryside and all. So what's that all about? Well, when something is happening in to either politically or in that case to the environment itself, people often you know, I don't know how else to put it, sort of run away from that. They get overwhelmed by modernity. The, the world is too much with them. The contemporary world is just too overwhelming for them. So they imagine a simpler time. It is not necessarily further back in time because it'd be a contemporary place. You have someone like Wordsworth actually moving to the great uh, the Lake District to a little town called Grashmere, um, which is pretty pastoral, and it's the way he imagines a pastoral world to be. So he's he's in his case he's literally trying to get away from the problems of technological modernity, which we all face today. That's different, right, than someone who faces them head on. So a little after Wordsworth, or actually they're, they're contemporaries in some way, someone like Elizabeth Gaskell will, will face those issues right head on. She's also a writer. She writes novels about, like one of them called Mary Barton, um, another North and South, about life in these factories and facing it and facing the, the problems that the workers have and the injustices, social justice issues, and a ton of them. She faces it head on. That's not what Wordsworth does. Wordsworth kind of runs away from them. So it's, it's interesting if you ever see a flurry of pastoral works. If pastoral, you know, it's been with us for, you know, almost 3,000 years, and it's, you know, less popular, more popular, more popular, less popular. If suddenly there's a flurry of activity and pastoral is becoming very important again, a lot of people are writing it. Yeah, I'd argue that's a good time to look what's happening either politically, if it's a veiled form of critique of politics, or what's happening with the environment itself, like in Wordsworth's time. Um, yeah, so let me show you this painting again. This is Asher Brown Durant's Pastoral Landscape, painted in 1661. So that was our visual um, example of pastoral. But it's painted in 1661, on the eve of the Civil War, and it's representing the landscape of America, right? If you were from another country, you know, Duran is saying, this is what America looks like. It's a beautiful pastoral country. You know, why is pastoral suddenly, why is this appearing now, and why is it representing that? You know, what's really happening in the countryside, and Duran is not facing it at all. He's, he's doing what Wordsworth did. He, he runs away to to, to an imagined perfect place. I mean, Wordsworth kind of found it in Grashmere, but here this is being constructed by Duran because what's really happening in the countryside, um, you know, in, in the southern United States is, you know, human beings were forced into slavery by the millions. There's nothing bucolic about this. This is, I mean, the actual representation, you know, a painting of what that was like would have been like the horror that people were experiencing being born and dying in slavery was absolutely horrific. Scenes of, you know, fields where people were, were working would have been horrible. And yet, you know, this guy, Duran, looks away from it all. Imagine something beautiful. And that's why it can signal kind of a break with reality, honestly. I mean, how, how could this be the American landscape? This is not the American landscape at the time. I mean, sure, you could find places like that, I'm, I'm sure, but that is not representative of the condition of rural America at the time. Nothing like it. And, you know, it's not shepherds walking around with their, in this case, you know, people walking around with their cows and all. It's a whole different scene. So 
That's why it's important not to take this stuff at face value. I mean, it may accurately represent what the landscape looks like at the time, but it might be something completely different as it is here. Um, and you have to realize, in part, because of a pastoral, how it functions, it gives us a way of running away from our problems. Um, and in that sense, you might be looking, you might be reading a depiction of or looking at a depiction of someone running away from the reality of, um, of their time. Yeah. yeah. Pastoral art, because it looks into the, you know, not too distant past, not and not too far away countryside, it 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 can it can be utopian, right? Um, and as I just said, signal a break with reality. So in that sense, you know, it's it's imagining the countryside or more broadly, it's imagining us in the countryside or us in the environment and imagining a perfect relationship with the, the planet. That's what this is all about, right? That's how it's, it's similar to Eden or the Golden Age, is this perfect relationship. If you're going to write in the pastoral form then, or, or paint or whatever, then you're going to have to do that. So Duran paints that, that perfect relationship with the planet, because, you know, you desperately want it to, to believe that, to see that, to, to, to not confront the reality. So it can be very utopian. It would be like if someone were painting, you know, a perfect utopian community far on the outskirts of society right now in the middle of the climate crisis. You know, that, that would not be representative of what's happening as we're having all sorts of impact of the climate crisis from weird weather like hurricanes and typhoons and tidal surges to wildfires and heat deaths and all the things happening with the climate crisis. If you were going to paint the reality of our relationship to the planet, those are the things that you would paint, not an idealistic group of people living in a utopian community, you know, where everything is perfect. Um, that would just, you know, be a running away from the problem, um, which we need to face head on. So that, that is kind of a, a signature move here, is people are not facing the issues. Um, and in some sense, not to predispose you against Henry David Thoreau, but in Walden, that's what happens. Well, Thoreau lives 15 miles south of Lowell, Massachusetts. Lowell, Massachusetts was the largest industrial um, city in the, in the United States at the time. It's sort of the equivalent of England's Manchester. Thoreau knew that. Thoreau had been there. Thoreau could have walked there in a day. But Thoreau decides to turn away and imagine this perfect rural life on the, the quiet shores of, of Walden Pond. It's an incredibly pastoral work, even though Thoreau is aware of this. I'm going to give you a quote from Thoreau in a minute. But yeah, so it can be very nostalgic, this pastoral. Um, from an environmental perspective, um, so... What's really funny, and Andy Goldsworthy actually makes this point in Rivers and Tides, which is the work that we didn't watch, but I explicated in order to introduce us to, um, um, to the way the Greeks thought of nature. Um, Goldsworthy notes the truth, the sheep, uh, the, uh, sheep are notorious for their ability to keep nearly any form of plant growing to maturity. Um, and I mentioned this before too, so right, so cows are sort of like lawnmowers, They're, they cut down the grass by eating what's growing up, but sheep literally rip up the roots of the plant, so you let them in a field long enough any plant coming up will be cut down. So you keep moving them around from field to field. This is an effectively effective way of keeping a forest come back once you've deforested it. So it's in no way a pristine environment that we're looking at if there are sheep there. Sheep are sort of like the second wave of environmental I won't say devastation, but changing and changing an environment. So, you know, we had a very um forest filled planet in different parts of the world, a lot of it, and especially in the West and Europe in particular, and then North America. And, you know, we cut all that down, but then how do you keep it in that, you know, um, cut down state without a lot of machinery? You don't need a lot of machinery. You just need a lot of sheep to do. So that's ironic because if this is imagined as the original relationship that human beings have, you know, if you go back far enough in time, you'll hit Eden or the golden age or pastoral communities, but no, that's not the original relationship that we had with the planet. The original relationship was, you know, it was a forested area without human beings there for a lot of Europe and, um, and North America. Yeah. 
Um, it's hardly an ideal, right? Because it's not necessarily the way um, landscapes would be without human intervention. Um, it, but especially since life is imagined in pastoral as being characterized by odium, it fits into the myth of the locus aminus. What I mean by odium, odium is just the Greek word for like leisure, not working. So whenever you see pictures of shepherds, you'll often see them doing, well, absolutely nothing. And the reason for that is because you know, it's kind of like Adam before the fall and, and in the golden age before the sort of fall that happens with Hesiod, um, people didn't have to do anything. The earth took care of you, right? It's a very kind, benevolent place. So you just put your faith in mother nature and she'll, she'll protect you and feed you and all. Um, so you don't really have to do anything. And, and this much is made of this, of course, in the Genesis account where Adam only has to labor and that's his punishment for disobedience to God. He only has to labor after after the fall. So um, this is, is imagined as a place where there's no real labor fitting in. So yeah. And and that the shepherd's lifestyle is one that can be characterized by by odium. Yeah. Um, so what are these shepherds doing then if they're if they don't have to actually, you know, do things like plowing up the land, which they definitely don't do here, working the soil and all. Um, they're often involved in things like um, singing contests and wooing shepherdesses. So if you if you look at most pastoral poems, you'll see one or two of those in there. Um, and again, these are imagined as pleasant, sort of like festival type things, but this is the life of the shepherd. It's a very relaxed, labor-free life. So it's, it's imagined as not only being perfect in the sense of, you know, a perfect landscape and all, but perfect because who wouldn't want to live a life where you don't, you never have to work. You could just go around singing all the time. Um, and it's worth noteworthy because if you read enough pastoral, you'll encounter it that the um, people who write about it or paint it um, often get so carried up with the idea. In other words, you can imagine, especially, right, what the world is, you know, if it's horrible in your period and you're imagining a perfect place and you're projecting yourself there, you actually kind of project yourself into the scene. I mean, you wish you were living there in a way. It's sort of like sci-fi in a way. It's imagining, you know, this, this other place where you can inhabit, certainly fantasy. And um, they often, the um, writers of the, these poems, one of these poems, they often think of, this poets, the pastoral songs being like their poems. So they're, they're really sort of confusing things a little. They're imagining themselves as being in the scene, which is kind of bizarre in a way. It's sort of like writing a fantasy and then writing yourself in as a character. Um, Thoreau, even though it was, um, he sort of makes the pastoral turn, he, he really nicely sums up what pastoral's about in a certain sense. And that is that pastoral is the view of the pasture from the living room window. I'm going to talk about this more, but the basic idea here is, and this is a really kind of a, this should be revealing, but it may be a revealing fact when we talk once we get into it, but it might be surprising at first hearing. And that is pastoral is generally never written from beautiful pastoral location. So you don't have, you know, what Theocritus is writing, Theocritus is not living out in the far countryside in a remote Greek island. Pastoral is almost always written from the point of view of a person living in the city. Pastoral is an urban art form. That's surprising, right? Because pastoral is just writing about the countryside. Pastoral should be like the ultimate country form, not the urban form. You think people would be writing about all the problems going on in cities and all. But no, you have a whole group of urban writers throughout history in the West who write about how beautiful and wonderful the countryside is and how wonderful life there is there and how they wish they were living there. And they may well wish they were there and they may well believe it's perfect but only from the perspective of the city. So let's, let's get into this a little further. Yep. It's largely an urban art form. Um, it depicts life and countryside as leisurely and perfect, which of course is rarely um, um, the case. So 
Um, why is it so perfect? Why is it imagined so perfect? Well, it's because you're not actually living there. Um, having, um, again, noting that I grew up on a farm, I can tell you that if you actually live there and grew up on a farm as a child, it, it, it's not what you would think it is. If you Certainly not if you just read pastoral liter literature. Certainly not if you just grew up in a city and read all sorts of wonderful depictions about how life and farms were, were wonderful and everything was great. Um, it's not like that, but it, and it can only be that way from someone writing from the perspective of like the city. It would be like someone in the city, you know, saying how perfect the city is. We can do that today because actually cities are, are pretty great today, in, in, in my humble opinion. Um, but certainly throughout, not through most of history, disease spread through a city. Crime was a problem. There were all sorts of problems like prior to the, the 20th century in cities. Not everywhere, but it was, you know, a, a signature problem for a lot of Western history. But, you know, here, it's it's clearly a projection. And often, in terms of like we were just saying, the projection is sort of the opposite of the reality. So if you live in a city where crime is a problem, a cornerstone of pastoral will be, there's no crime there. It's a beautiful place. If disease is a problem and all, no one ever gets sick in pastoral. So you can see, in a way, it's a direct response to the problems of your era. It's, it's curious that way. Yeah. So it, it can be in response to a political situation. So I mentioned like the Civil War. So Duran, you know, couldn't face the reality of what was actually happening in the southern United States, you know, out in the agricultural areas. Um, but it can also be if there is an environmental problem. If there is an environmental problem, then pastoral can can imagine a world free of it. So that's confusing, right? Because you would think that the writer would just write about the problem head on. But no, the writer writes about a place where there are no problems. So that should be a dead giveaway. And it, throughout most Western history, it's not been a dead giveaway because people didn't realize this. They actually thought that that's literally the way it is. But that should be a dead giveaway that things might not be as perfect as they seem. So Rachel Carson, of course, is the work we finish with in this class. Um, Silent Spring opens the first three pages of it with a, a wonderfully, almost classically pastoral depiction of an idyllic um, country life in America in order to draw attention to it being threatened by DDT use and all. So Carson is not like a simple pastoral. In fact, she knows that there are problems and the rest of that book after those first, really it's two and a half pages, after those first two and a half pages, she's going to confront the problems directly. So Rachel Carson's not running away like Wordsworth. Rachel Carson is straight there. But she does want, she does use it in a very clever way to get people to realize that something is going on that's causing a problem. It didn't used to be this way. We might think this is just the nature of, you know, a relationship to the environment. She says, no, it, you know, go back a generation or two before, again, a signature move of pastoral. She imagines a perfect place. She knows it wasn't perfect. And Rachel Carson is a very smart person. She knows it wasn't perfect, you know, a, a generation or two before her writing this in the 1960s, early 60s. But she does that because I think most of her readers imagined in a very pastoral way that a generation or two ago, everything was perfect. She wants to argue, okay, if you want to believe that, fine, believe it. But it's not perfect now, and it's our fault, and let's let's confront that, which, of course, Silent Spring does in, a, in an absolutely wonderful and, and very important way. So let's talk about environmental consciousness. We hear this term a lot, and what does that mean in this way? So when pastoral literature draws attention to the countryside and environmental dangers threatening it, it may be that the writer had developed an environmental consciousness and was trying to pass it on to the reader. So let's assume someone like Carson is confronting the problem head on. She's very aware that there's a problem environmentally because of the use of chemicals like DDT, and she focuses almost exclusively on DDT, um, and she wants to communicate that. That's because she's developed an environmental consciousness. Carson is, 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 is like the quintessential um, modern environmentalist who does that, and we'll talk about that when we get to her. But it, it could be that they've done that. So how does this work? Let's go through an example here. Um, 
for, it, so the idea here is if you're not fully aware of an, an environment, you know, you may not think a lot about it. So let me give you an example, a related example, and then I'll explain what this little blurb here means. Um, let's say you have a friend and you have a very good friendship with this person. You see this person every day. And the fact is you probably don't think a lot about the friendship necessarily. Hopefully you do, but maybe not. Maybe you take it for granted. But let's say that person were being taken away from you. That person was very sick or even just moving and all. Suddenly the friendship would come into, into stark relief. Suddenly the thing that you took for granted, didn't think a lot about, would be something you weren't taking for granted at all and thinking a great deal about. So you know, um, it's often the case we're born into an environment, whatever it is, it can be a perfect environment, it can be a farm like I was born into. But surprisingly, you don't really think about it necessarily, because we're just going through our lives. Um, in that sense, you know, think of it like a play, right? So in a play, the action is on the human beings, right? And most plays have human beings. Um, and what they're doing, and the backdrop is just this sort of painted thing that's there that isn't very important because the focus is on the human action. Well, for a lot of us, we focus on the human action and we don't really look at the backdrop that much. We're not very mindful of it. It's a big mistake. We should be, but we're not necessarily very mindful of it. But something can make us mindful of it. So let me jump into an example. Um, yeah, before giving the example, um, if something should endanger the environment, such as it being threatened or become or us becoming more aware of it, you know, um, or, or it being endangered, we become more aware of it. So let me actually jump to the next slide and give you an example. Um, Santa Barbara, uh, one of the cornerstone or milestone events in the modern environmental movement was in 1969. At that point, the worst oil spill ever in U.S. history happened right off the coast of Santa Barbara. Now, prior to that spill, you know, people in Santa Barbara were, of course, aware of their beaches. People may have gone out on the beach every day. But because of that oil spill, suddenly, you know, they became aware of their environment, their beach, their, their environment in a, in a very direct way, right? So you might have walked along that beach every day of your life and not looked that carefully at it. But suddenly when there's, you know, oil on it and dead birds and a horrible scene there, suddenly you would have become aware of it and aware of it fully at that moment and aware of it as endangered. So it's ironic. It's like, you know, the friend who's, you know, becoming lost to you, you just don't really see them or that friendship until that moment. And at this moment, in terms of a specific environmental example, Example, this is how people became aware of the environment and and how beautiful and important it was only at the moment of it being endangered. It, before that, people may have just not been aware. And I, I offered this as an example because, you know, people by the thousands turned out and protested this because suddenly, you know, they were, they were deeply aware of their environment and caring about it in a way that they just hadn't before. That's an environmental consciousness. So when you walk along the beach and you just don't notice it, yeah, you're kind of vaguely conscious of it. But in this case, after the oil spill happened, people, you know, it was, it had percolated up. It was, it was the central thing in their mind at the time. They had developed an environmental consciousness because of it. And that gives birth to the modern environmental movement. Um, artists and writers, you know, can develop an environmental consciousness too, like anyone else. So if you were an artist or writer living in Santa Barbara in 1969, you could have developed an environmental consciousness, suddenly saw the beach in a way you hadn't seen it before, cared about it in a way you hadn't before. Um, this is what happens to Rachel Carson. She becomes aware of the environment as endangered, uh, not because of an oil spill, but because of the wholesale use of DDT and, and widespread pesticide use. So again, anyone this can happen to, but it can happen to writers and artists too. Carson's a good example. But when it does, then this presents another problem. Because if you're a writer and you're an artist and you want to communicate this, communicate your environmental consciousness to the reader, how do you do that? So in other words, if you lived in Santa Barbara and this actually happened to you directly, it would have been your experience. The experience would have brought about environmental consciousness in you. But what if you want to give someone else that experience 
without experiencing it directly, without making everyone come to Santa Barbara uh, and to see the, you know, the beaches. How do you do that? Um, you know, the, the artist has to gesture to the environment, either to the pristine one being threatened or the environment already damaged by human action or both. So you're an artist in Santa Barbara in 1969. You could make a beautiful picture, a painting of the landscape, uh, and, and it would be meant to show how valuable and wonderful it was and what was being threatened. Alternately, you could have a painting that was horrific, that showed the oil and the death and the destruction and everything, you know, or you could have maybe both together in some way, you know, the pristine um, environment and then maybe, you know, the oil just starting to wash up on the shore and all. But what you'd be trying to do there is communicate your awareness and what you were feeling to the, the audience. And that can be a tricky business, but that's kind of the business that an artist um, is in, especially a pastoral artist in this sense. Um, so I mentioned traditionally pastoral has been written by urban poets for an urban audience. Um, so what traditionally was done is there, you know, artists are very unhappy with the city where they lived and all the problems and all. So instead they drew attention to the pristine, you know, uh, landscape where, for example, there may be no crime and that would be a way of critiquing crime, um, or at least turning away from it and imagining a perfect place. Um, they, they may not even been aware of it, right? They're just trying to imagine a perfect place. And of course, if they're just having a great time singing, you know, shepherd songs and all, they're not going to have crime intrude on it. So that's the way they did it. And they may not have been aware of it when they were doing it, even though it's an important point. Um, so if you think about it, it's, you know, the the urban reader you know looked at the countryside but it's sort of like through a sort of twisted kind of mirror because they're seeing their own environment but but sort of turned around right an environment where there's crime is turned around to those environments with no crime but if you look carefully and if you're reading that text and you start seeing these signature moves like no crime and everyone has enough to eat and all you might you know you might occur to you well wait maybe there was crime in the city. Maybe people didn't have enough to eat. Why is this being foregrounded? So it's an interesting way to learn about a culture, not by what an artist is saying, but what by the opposite of what is being said or depicted. Yeah. Um, what's really interesting is historically, um, because we ourselves have been born into a pastoral culture, so we have this same nostalgic thing working on us. What I mean by that is if you ask a lot of Americans, they think back to another, to a few, you know, um, generations ago where life was wonderful in the United States to maybe the early 20th century or sometime in the 19th century where people lived on farms and, you know, ate organic food and milked their own cows and had a very nice life. Um, if you, because we imagine that when we go back 400 years ago in Shakespeare's time or 2,300 years ago in Theocritus's time, and we have writers writing about how wonderful and beautiful the countryside is, we believe it. And this has happened to a lot of critics and a lot of thinkers over the centuries. They actually believe that what Theocritus was writing about was accurate, even though Theocritus wasn't in Greece at the time. He was in Alexandria, um, you know, many hundreds of miles away, writing in, in, in the biggest city in the Western world at the time, or pretty much, um, writing about a rural countryside. So he had basically, he grew up in a rural area in Greece, but he was projecting something very definitely. Um, and people have just wanted to believe that that was an accurate depiction of what the countryside was really like. But but it's anything but. That's um, that's a, a danger with, with pastoral, and that is that you read it too literally and buy into what someone's saying too much. Um, yeah, and because this is ironic for this reason, that, you know, you're drawing attention and depicting a pristine environment um, only because it's in striking contrast to a, to a very um, unpristine one. Yeah. So artists can, it's interesting here that, you know, um, artists can either write about what's going on directly, and they don't often do that in the pastoral tradition, or they can do just the opposite, write, you know, about a pristine environment and not confront it directly. So both are happening here with pastoral. 
Yep. If someone is writing about the real reality of the, say, the environment at the time, that's kind of like an anti-pastoral. Um, in, in, you know, um, an example, well, let me, actually, let me jump right into, I think we can visually see this best, through an artist, Andy Goldsworthy, I'm sorry, Edward Rutinsky is our second artist. There's actually a documentary about him that I used to require him in this class, I don't anymore because we have too much else to do, called Manufactured Landscapes. And let me just walk you through what Rutinsky is doing as a way of understanding how this sort of anti-pastoral can work. So I know I, I gave a little definition of in the previous slide, but let me just jump right in and show you. Um, this is one of Bertinsky's landscapes. Um, he does very large scale, Ed Bertinsky, um, photographs. Um, these were originally done with traditional cameras and now are done with digital ones, but they're, you can literally, they're taller than a human being if you see them on display in a, in a gallery in a show. Um, but there's something familiar about all his landscapes, I would argue. And this is one, I mean, this looks like it could be from another planet, right? This could be in a sci-fi uh, TV show or something, but this is it, right? So you're looking at a stream going through a landscape but what a different stream. This is actually a real landscape. Um, but Pertinsky doesn't want to give you this. He doesn't want to be like Theocritus and tell you about the beautiful countryside where everything is green and the water is babbling through. He wants to face it head on directly. So that's anti-pastoral, but what's refreshing about it is it's not buying into the way pastoral has traditionally worked and giving you this wonderful depiction. That's the reality of it. Um, and they remind us, you know, something that we have seen, which they are in fact gesturing toward. So let's go a little more with this. Um, and this is it. This is a river that gives life to its surroundings. Notice around here, notice how everything is especially green, I mean, and the plants here. And, you know, what's not around the river, and this is an accurate depiction probably in the southwest of the United States, where, you know, um, away from the river, you know, life is sort of pulling away and all. So in that case, the river is what we imagine rivers and babbling brooks to be, actually giving life to an area. This, you know, um, notice here, everything is dead. There is nothing alive here, nothing verdant, nothing green. Even the trees, and this is where Bertinsky is so great with his, his photographs, you know, they're dead. This is obviously taking place in the winter, but this is meant to draw attention to a real problem. And just to let you know, what Bertinsky is doing is going to industrial sites, and he's showing us what we are doing to the planet, how we are destroying the planet through our industrial operations. Um, you know, in traditional pastoral, you're imagining like a perfect scene. Um, and then what really is being talked about, if you look carefully, is, is an imperfect scene, like whether it's an urban setting or like what was happening during the Civil War and all. Bertinsky is the opposite. He is not turning away. He is not doing that signature move of these pastoral poets where they look away from the problem. He's facing it head on, and he's going to be addressing these problems. So fascinating that for thousands of years we didn't do it, but with someone like Ed Bertinsky, we are doing Doing it. Um, yep. So it's not surprising though, right? Because now that we are endangering landscapes through our industrial operations and the spread of, you know, our civilization, it's not surprising that people would begin focusing on the problems. So it's kind of hard in, in that sense for us to really get a wrap our heads around pastoral because we know that the planet is kind of screwed up by us and we're not really thinking about necessarily pristine places because they're almost, they're, they are receding very quickly. Um, but this is what artists are doing. They're, they're, they're sort of spreading the environmental consciousness that, that we all now have, unfortunately. Um, yep. Yeah. So giving, you know, the endangered landscape precedence over pristine ones is a particularly clever move, um, because it avoids the dangers that you're going to think that the pristine landscape is really the actual subject. So if you're reading Theocritus, you might think that life is really like that. And, and many people did for thousands of years in reading him rather than realize that no, that's a distorted representation that he is making from the city. It's not at all what it's like. 
When Ed Bertinsky hits you with, with something like this, you realize that that's, that's, that's environmental devastation. There's no confusion, right? You're not going to be confused and think that's a nice place. Um, yeah. And what is it like? Well, look, these little hills here and all. Again, Bertinsky so often does this. It's meant to be evocative of this. In other words, with like mountaintop removal, which is the way that coal is um, mined in parts of the world, the Western United States in particular, um, you literally plow all this down. I mean, huge machinery. I mean, trucks bigger than a house come in and, and cut everything down and, and just to get the, um, the coal out like that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So again, traditional pastoral don't buy into it and mistakenly assume that it's really about a uh, pastoral countryside. Um, that you know, and and instead be cautious that it might really be gesturing to another problem. So Duran gives us this view of the American landscape in 1661, but I'm um, sorry, uh, 1861. But then, you know, know that there's, there's something else there um, that's, that's not pastoral at all. So um, Bertinsky, um, let's jump to the next one, sidesteps this problem because you're not going to mistake that. Um, if he's showing what he's showing you, that, that Red River or that, you know, mountain that's been cut down, um, he avoids it. But it is noteworthy that his sort of anti-pastoral, what I'm calling it here, is, is like pastoral in the sense that they can really talk about two landscapes. So, yes, Bertinsky is showing you that Red River, but he wants you to see that babbling brook. So both are at play here, and, and in his case, he wants us to be aware that this is human interaction that's done that. So let me give you an example of some other uh, gestures that Bertinsky does. So... Um, this is a shipping, uh, um, ship reclamation operation in Bangladesh. And this, what happens is, and if you if you watch the film, I think I'll put it all in Gaucho space if I can, um, you can actually see people cutting these ships up one by one. Um, but what this is here, and it's such a remarkable thing to think about, this is a view of the ocean. This is a beach. This is a beach in Bangladesh, and it's meant to be invocative of a beach in Santa Barbara. If you, if you, you know, if you were to paint a uh, um, a beach or or draw a picture of one or describe it to someone, you're almost always going to do this. But this is what Bertinsky wants to smack us in the face with. This is why it's anti-pastoral. That's a friggin' beach. Um, and this is, this is, you know, the condition of technological modernity and where we are today. And if you watch the documentary, it's, it's horrific to see people, you know, knee-deep in oil on the bottom of these ships, cutting them up in little pieces so they can be, you know, reclaimed. And, yeah, it's great they're recycling the metal, but that's a striking image to think of, to, to look at and think about. And that's exactly what Bertinsky wants us to do. Um, again, another one of Bertinsky's Red Rivers, you know, industrial operations, and it's meant to look like this. It's, it's, you know, he does it again and again. And, you know, you, you can't look at that really without thinking of this because we've all seen so many pictures like this. And he wants us to, to, to you know, to reflect back on that. Um, this is another great one, right? This is, uh, this is a, a mining operation. And you can't really see it in this photo, but the like the trucks here and all are just tiny, which gives you an idea of the scope of it. But really, it's supposed to be this. This this is a beautiful mountain that that got cut down and made into this. I mean, you know how this worked, by the way. I mean, this there's a hill above here, and you know that's just cut down. You keep cutting down, and you wind your way down. And you know there aren't people working in mine shafts and all now. This is all done on the large industrial level, where it's all you know carted away in trucks and 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 broken into the constituent parts that they're mining for here. So, but, but Pratinsky very much wants you to imagine a pristine landscape, and this is anything but. Yeah. So that's Ed Pratinsky, and that's the. Uh, quick view of what pastoral is. We're going to take more of a look at pastoral next time 
with Virgil as well. And this is where the political um, situation gets intertwined with the environmental one. But the main thing to, to take away here uh, from this is that this was the West's principal way of talking about the environment, writing, depicting, painting the environment for thousands of years. It imagines a pristine landscape, and it often does so during particularly turbulent and unpristine times. And that's very revealing because what it means then, if you go back and look at pastoral carefully, if you don't buy into it being about the really pristine setting, and you look at like Duran's painting from you know 1861, suddenly you realize there's a lot that that can tell us about what was happening at the time. And that's why it's important because pastoral both is an enduring way of looking at the, the world, but it's also a revealing way of seeing what what was really going on at the world at the time. And we'll take this up again next time because it is just so important because, again, this is like the primary form of nature writing. But we're not going to be looking at the face value. We're going to kind of burrow in a little the way we have been doing here. Okay, so that's it. And Pastoral Part 2 will be coming up in the next lecture. Take care.